just to recap what we did last time, um, we discussed these time levels. And uh, what they were were these classical steam solutions on the ABS5 and S5, specifically on the R plus S2 subspace. Um, the metric that we worked with was the following one. It's R squared minus T squared plus R squared D phi squared plus D R squared over 1 minus R squared. So this is the R plus S2 subspace of the ABS5 plus S5. Um, we plug this into the non go to action, solve for the equations of motion uh, under very particular onsets. And uh, the a solution that we found was this giant lagging solution. And this was given by some constant over cosine. I'm just going to write this in general as I explained in the tut. Phi tau from sigma plus t tau from sigma. For the principle, I can also add some constant here. Uh, of course, you can absorb that into phi and t as well. But this is the general solution of the repagmentization invariance. Um, and the specific choice that we worked with was say phi is equal to sigma minus tau, and t I identify as wall sheet tau. Then uh, these diametral solutions were given by c over cosine sigma plus sigma zero. Right. So these solve the equations of motion. Uh, in order to get the final solution, I need to impose boundary conditions. What we imposed was that um, at sigma is equal to zero, uh, r is one, so that sigma is equal to delta phi, so what's the angular extent of this object? Um, it's again one. In the tutorial, I gave you the problem of working with different boundary conditions, and I just wanted to show you that that is also possible. I right? consider an object with different or dynamics of different boundary conditions than the one we used in the lecture. Um, but one thing that this is the general solution to the equations of motion, and I can use recapitalization in the areas to get this one. In the tutorial, I also asked uh, what if I change the metric a little with the ordinate transformation? That coordinate transformation just feeds into the solution we heard down there in a very simple way. So, your last two questions. Where is the information for velocity? Uh, I'm going to get to that. Once we, once we compute the um, energy, this is what I'm going to set up to do in this lecture. Compute the energy, compute the angular momentum, and then it's going to become clear where the uh, where that is. So, we just imposed the boundary condition that we had before. This is going to be cosine of delta phi over 2 over cosine of sigma minus delta phi over 2. Where, as, as I said last time, what this diagonal solution looks like on the R on the S2, it's essentially something like this. We're looking at a constant velocity, and this angular extent is what I call delta phi. We're going to find an interpretation for this delta phi um, after we've computed the energy and prepared that to a uh, result in the gauge field that MQ is already introduced. Alright, so what we're going to want to do today is first compute the energy of the solution and compute the angular momentum. Um, now, to do this, I actually took a few people in the tutorial. And to do this, what I need to do is compute the, the charge. I might be butchering that name, I'm sorry. But, uh, um, but we need to compute the uh, conserved charge and current associated with time translations and angle translations. Now, I know a lot of you have seen this in the context of classical mechanics before, but I just want to briefly perhaps say what it looks like in the field theory and how I go about doing it. So, Suppose I make a transformation, so I've got some Lagrangian that depends on a set of fields and their derivatives and various coordinates, so it could be phi a prime, phi a dot, etc. You can have many more coordinates if you wish. And I make some transformation such that delta phi a, uh, I'm just going to say that this is psi a. But the psi a can be a function of the coordinates or it can be a constant. In our case, we're just going to look at simple translations, and this is going to be some constant. We'll discuss just now. But I make this transformation on the fields, and uh, what happens is that the Lagrangian changes by a total domain. As Terun explained, 
I'm still going to consider this facility. If the Lagrangian change is by a total good relative, that's completely fine. I just absorb that. This is going to feed into my uh, conserved current at the end of the day. So let's say that this happens. I'll make some transformation. Uh, the Lagrangian changes by a total derivative. Then you can show that the following quantity is a conserved current. So take a derivative of this Lagrangian with respect to some derivative of the field. So phi a, I'll dot this with the psi a where it told me how uh, you know, these fields change by themselves. And then subtract this function if we Right. So let's say we're working in a three-dimensional space. And this has a time component. And uh, um, no, let's actually just work in a two-dimensional space that we're going to be considering. So J could potentially have two components. It could have a tau component, I'm going to call J0. And it can have a sigma component, and I'm going to call J1. And the right-hand side here reads the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot multiplied by the change um, of that, you know, some translation dot with that. So see, there's an A and there's an A, so there's a translation in time. But I'm going to need to um, you know, take this as T, and this is the translation of it. It's going to be complete when we look at the example now. And if the Lagrangian changes by a total derivative term, I need to subtract that off. Why I say this is a conserved charge? So you can show that if I take the following combination, so I take a divergence of this vertical I get, I'm going to get zero. Alright. Now, if I have this, then I know that the conserved charge is going to be defined as or given by integral of take the zero of component of this and integrate it over all the other um, parameters I have here. So in our case we have a tau and a sigma, so I'm going to have to integrate this over sigma. If you add additional coordinates, I need to with them as well. So for instance, if this was uh, you know, three plus one dimensions, I'd have a three-dimensional integral to the And that's how I compute the conserved charges of the object. So let's just take a simple example. Let's take time translation. What is that going to mean? Well, my Lagrangian is going to depend on the coordinates uh, time, and time is derivative, and time is sigma, and it's also going to depend on phi, etc. I'm just going to focus on the time bit of this now. Suppose I make the following transformation, but uh, delta t is equal to um, you know, some translation, let's just normalize that to 1. So time goes to time plus some constant. So if you're looking at the Lagrangian, the time derivative, what is that? Oh, so this is, um, so in this case, you must think of this as a function of tau and sigma. So when I say dot, the uh, time derivative might be a bit misleading. So t is really time, but when I say a dot, I mean a derivative with respect to tau. Tau does not necessarily have the interpretation of time. It could have, you know, I could choose any coordinates I like to for uh, It's often a convenient choice to identify that exactly with time, but you don't have to make the choice. Um, right. So suppose I do this, then you can show that uh, the Lagrangian does not change. The reason for that is that there's no explicit time dependency in this metric. So, what is going to happen So, f is going to be zero in this expression. And uh, this is going to tell me that I need to compute the conserved current. This is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to d, d mu t. So, so, I could have had here t and uh, then I follow that, you know. Um, so in principle, I should have something like delta L over D, D mu phi, but there's no change in phi, so this gets multiplied with the zero, all right, et cetera. So this is the only bit that's important. And of course, um, now let's just have a look at what are the components of this. So J zero is equal to delta L over D, T dot, J one, given by dl over d t prime. All right. And uh, in the choices we made, this is just exactly zero. Um, well, of course, if I want to compute the conserved 
charge uh, doesn't really matter because J1 doesn't, doesn't feature in the formula for the sort of charge. But at the end of the day, the point is that time translations implies that the conserved charge associated with that is given by the integral of a dl over dt dot dc. Right. Everyone happy with this? Right. Now rush through this a little. And I don't think my derivation is the cleanest ever, uh, unfortunately, but th it's, this is the main idea. I try to see how the Lagrangian changes in a certain symmetry transformation. By symmetry transformation, I mean that the Lagrangian remains unchanged up to a total derivative. And those terms that I get after the transformation feature in some way in the conserved current that I have there. Now, by definition, you can compute this explicitly and carefully. I would advise you to maybe look at the textbook to, to do that. And the point is, once I have this conserved current, I can use that to compute the associated uh, conserved charge of each of these symmetry transformations. Right. In our case, we're going to be considering Q, uh, that is uh, the conserved charge associated with time translations. And you can also show that J, which is the conserved current associated with angular translations, um, is going to be given by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot DC. Right. So these are the two objects that you want to compute if you want to compute the energy and the angular momentum of the solution. Right. But now to do this, um, we're going to need to use. I wouldn't say a few tricks, but the computation can get quite... Okay, where do I switch these lights? Can okay, everyone see on the board, by the way? I think it might be a little bit dim. Can everyone in the back see? Okay, as long as that's the case, I'm happy. So, um, to compute these, the terms can get quite out of hand because we've got you know, functions t, phi, and r that in principle depend on tau and sigma. So, um, it can get a bit messy. But the following procedure, I think, is a reasonably clean one to derive these. So I'm just going to go through it a little bit carefully and a, and a little slower. So, the wall sheet metric, before we plug in this ansatz that we have over here, um, is given as follows. It's given by R squared. And then in the tau tau bit of the wall sheet, I have T dot minus plus R squared phi dot squared plus R dot squared over 1 minus R squared. Right. So how do I get this expression? Well, I say that there are three coordinates. There's T phi R. Make them all functions of tau and sigma tau and sigma, tau and sigma. And then this object over there is nothing else than x dot mu x dot mu. So take that vector that's a dot or a you know, tau derivative of that vector and take its dot product of itself with respect to that metric. The metric is diagonal. That's why this looks very similar to the expression I've done for the metric. Now there are no cross terms, unlike the tutorial. Alright, so that gives me the tau component for the uh, uh, tau sigma component. I get the dot d prime plus r squared phi dot phi prime plus r dot r prime over one minus r squared. So exactly the same reasoning, but it's diagonal. Compute this. This is just exactly the same as the other off diagonal component. And uh, for this one, I'm just going to get minus t prime squared plus r squared phi prime squared plus um, r prime squared over 1 minus r squared. All right. So this is the wall sheet metric. And my Lagrangian, I'm just going to take this factor of r squared out uh, for now. I'm just going to say that Lagrangian is proportional to g tau sigma squared minus g tau tau g sigma sigma and I'll restore the r squared dependence at the very end of the computation. Alright. So, if I want to take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to t dot, then what is that going to mean? The Lagrangian with respect to t dot? Well, 
I'm just going to, and um, I'm going to take that derivative and then afterwards plug in my ansatz. And this is a bit of an important step. It's important not to first plug in the ansatz and then take the derivatives because the t dot dependence is going to disappear completely once I, once I do this. There's not going to be an explicit t dot. So you first need to take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to t dot and then plug in your ansatz for the form of the explicit dependence in town So let's just have a look at what this is going to mean. Well, this is a square root, so I'm going to get you know, um, this, is going to, this is something to a power of a half. So after the derivative, I'm going to get a half times this to the power of minus a half. So it's going to be something over 2 times the Lagrangian. And then I need to look at this expression over here. I see that there's only a tau dot dependence in the tau tau component and in the tau sigma component. There's no tau dot, uh, tau dot dependence in the sigma sigma component. So this is going to be... <coughs> Let's look at the first term. So I'm going to get 2 times the derivative with respect to t dot of g tau sigma. Multiply that with g tau sigma. And then I'm going to subtract the derivative of this combination here. And that's the derivative of g tau tau with respect to t dot times g sigma sigma. Alright. And then once I've computed this, I'm going to plug in my ansatz for its form. Right. Okay, so let's just see what we get from this. <coughs> so if I take a tau dot derivative of this first term over here, what I'll get is, oh, uh, there should be a square there, something like that. So, what I'm going to get um, for this tau sigma bit I'm going to get, okay, let me just pause here because I think I skipped a few steps in my notes. So what's going to happen to these terms over here? Well, this first term is going to give me zero. The reason being that I'm going to take a derivative with respect to tau dot of this. I'm just going to be left with t prime. But t prime at my ansatz that I made here is zero. Right? t is not a function of sigma at all. So this first term is going to disappear. The second term is going to give me something non-zero. So let's just compute that. So I'm going to get the minus. The derivative of tau tau g tau tau with respect to t dot is minus 2 times t dot. All right. And no other terms. And I need to multiply this with g sigma sigma. Now this is what I get for that. As I said, t prime is 0. 5 prime is non-zero. You can work this out to just give me the following 5 prime squared r squared plus r prime squared of 1 minus r squared. Alright? And then I still need to plug in my ansatz into this term. And I've forgotten the over 2 times the Lagrange. Alright. And if I plug in this ansatz that I made, so phi is equal to sigma minus tau, t is equal to tau, and uh, r is this specific combination. Uh, actually, after I've that, oh, actually, I don't think I've it in this step yet. Then I get r squared minus r to the 4 plus r prime squared over 1 minus r squared square root of r squared all right. And then, of course, I still need to plug in my ansatz. There's the missing piece of the ansatz is still what's the, oh, I say ansatz here, this, I must actually plug in the solution of R, from of the equations of motion. Because my ansatz is just the form of phi and t, R specific dependence, so R is just a function of sigma. And uh, then the solution is that explicit form over there, that it's C over cosine sigma plus C. Alright, so <clears throat> let's take that expression that we've got, plug that in, and uh, see if we can compute the energy. I'm just going to let all of you have the bits that I need.
Right. <coughs> so I know that this is gives me the element of T dot. Up to that R squared term that I just dropped for the sake of the conciseness. And now into that expression. So remember, what I want to do is.
Del phi of two to del phi of two. <coughs> I get a very big simplification. Delta phi of two of a cosine squared sigma d sigma. And uh, this integral you can do, and it gives you a final answer. I get r squared over pi of prime sine of delta phi over 2. Right. So even though these integrals are divergent <coughs> singularly, the difference gives me a final answer. Right. Now, how do we make sense of this? Let's, uh, let's just first um, do the following. And um, I'm going to tell you that this e minus j and in terms of the ADS CFT correspondence can be computed exactly. Q mentioned this in these lectures. Basically, results from uh, the representation theory of issue 2 2, issue 2 2 squared. You can compute the energy of these kinds of excitations exactly, not perturbative. And uh, the result you find is the following. I get something like square root 1 plus lambda over pi squared sine squared period 2. This is the exact expression. Okay. I think my constants here is just different from those that the Q used. I didn't take a uh, use notation now, unfortunately. But in some choice of the constants, this is the expression you get for the exact expression. Now, you stare at these two a little and you see that they are very similar to one another. The first thing to note is that lambda in the dictionary needs to be identified with square root lambda is equal to r squared for the alpha prime. All right. So what I have actually here is square root lambda over pi times sine delta phi over 2. This just comes from the NDSCFT dictionary, how I should identify these parameters in string theory. And now you can see, well, clearly, um, what I need to do to solve these two is, you know, or equate these two is firstly identify delta phi, so the angular extent of these giant magnets, identify this with P, the momentum of these spin chain, uh, you know, excitations. And then the second thing is to take the large lambda limit of this expression. And uh, the large lambda limit, you can think of taking a large n limit. And uh, this, of course, uh, if I want to compute that object in the dual string theory picture, what do I need to do? I need to study classical string theory. That's exactly what we've done. We studied classical string theory, come up to with some answer for E minus j. And, um, you know, uh, not surprisingly, from the dictionary, we come up with exactly the answer that we need. If we take this object, take the large n limit in response to um, taking you know, classical string theory, and all we need to do is just identify this angular extent with momentum, and then we're done. Then, we're, then we've got an interior between the um, dimensions of operators in the uh, you know, n is equal to 4 super n volts, that, and the energies of certain excitations um, in the uh, string theory picture. Now, as I say energies, what I really mean is E minus J. Now, how do I make sense of that? Now, I'm uh, hopefully going to comment a bit more on this if I have time in the next lecture. If not, then those of you who are welcome to come and have a chat with me. But essentially, what these states are due to are single trace operators, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first lecture. And uh, what I need to think of is I've got, you know, um, Three complex uh, combinations of scalar fields, and is equal to four super animals. And I call these Z, Y, X, and I can also take their targets. Um, what I need to do to find these sorts of, um, to find deals of these uh, string theory states is take a trace of, let's say I get Z, take a large number of Z. Instead of few impurities, somewhere along this chain, and this just goes on top. Right. <clears throat> Specifically, I'm thinking of Z as, when I say a large number, this goes by something like square root of um, Now, what does J compute for me? J computes for me the bare dimension of all this. So, J computes for me 
the total number of these in this order. If I'm making a mistake, then someone can, of course, correct me as seen this before. But this computes something like the total number of Z's. I've said that the number of Z's grows like square root n, so in the classical picture, this should diverge. This should go to infinity. <coughs> what does the, so this is what J counts for me. What does E count for me? Well, E counts for me the scaling dimension of this operator. And what is that going to be? Well, the Z scales like 1. So it's going to be, you know, roughly j coming from the number of z's plus the dimension coming from these impurities that I've added, plus delta. So and this delta is something that comes due to the fact that I've inserted some y impurities into this chain. And so as you can see, this goes like j plus this, so this also diverges. However, the difference is something that gives me a finite answer. The difference tells me exactly what's the anomalous dimensions associated with these impurities in this very large chain, this very large operator that I have. And this is what we've computed here. And this is why the answers we got here are actually very sensible. P should diverge. J should diverge. But the difference should give me something um, finite in this. Right. I'll comment a bit more on the duality in the next picture. I think the most important result is just uh, this one that we've here. And the fact that for the correspondence, what you need to do is identify delta phi with the momentum of this. Alright, right. are there any questions about this? Alright, so this, this is, is. Is there momentum? Is that the open mass momentum? I believe so, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'll need to think about it a bit, but I believe so, yes. What sets up um, Z to be in the order of the roots of N? Because I thought it would be in the order of N. Um, so, the scaling of the operators that we consider in N is equal to 4 super N with respect to N corresponds to different objects in the dual string theory picture. Um, now uh, the exact motivation, I can't remember very well, but the following classification you get roughly. If I get operators that are of length order 1, these correspond to point-like strings. Um, if I consider operators that are of length order root n, this corresponds to strings. And this is why the operators were interested in um, go like square root n. It's just because the corresponding dual object should be strings. If I consider operators of order n, and this you can certainly do, these correspond to um, d brains, uh, giant gravitons. And then if I stack a large number of these guys together, like, which I can also do, consider operators of order n squared, then what happens is that, so in this case, I add this object onto some background, and I say that um, it's not. Uh, you know, it doesn't perturb the background at all. I can still study D brains living on AS5 plus S5. When I've got a very large number of them, I can no longer ignore the back reaction onto the metric, and I need to consider a different geometry. The geometry you need to consider in this case is exactly the LLM geometries I gave you in the last top problem. So this is what happens. When I start stacking a large number of these D brains into my AS5 plus S5 geometry, they perturb the geometry, and I get out some LLM geometry. And in the last problem, I asked you to show that these giant magnons are still solutions, even in an LLM background. And that's why they're very interesting um, objects to study. Um, exactly because they have, you know, they're protected against these perturbations of the metric. They're still solutions. Um, but, but yeah, this, this is the reason that this is, this is the problem. All right. So, um, in terms of the properties of the giant magnon, this is roughly all I have about them. Um, so you can also say what we've written down is a single giant magnet, um, cal calculated its angular momentum and its dispersion relation. I uh, showed it in infinite, but the difference is a finite number. And now the next obvious thing to ask is, um, you know, what if I have multiple uh, magnets in, in a in a bag? What if I write out something that is multiple? If I write a number of them, as I said, they have you know, some angle that I associated with the 
vector. So I can think of this as a scattering problem. Um, you know, uh, these two magnums, maybe they interchange, you know, the angular extent of the time, uh, which corresponds to some scattering problem. Um, and can I write down these sorts of solutions? Okay. But the first attempt to do this uh, is a bit futile. So the first thing you try to do is say, we've got a very particular ansatz to come uh, to these time angle solutions. Essentially what they've done is said that R is only going to be a metric that I've unfortunately deleted, but R is only a function of phi of tau sigma plus t tau sigma. Or in other words, if I choose this to be sigma minus tau, or this to be tau, we've basically made the answer that R is only a function of this force you call in sigma. This is a very really specific answer that we made. Um, and in order to find other solutions, I either have to make a different ansatz or work with the solutions in general, which is a tricky thing to do. If I was to change this ansatz and say that this is work for just being a function of sigma, give it an explicit tau dependence as well, then the equations of motion become far behind this. And uh, if you can solve them, I, you know, I, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd say contact me immediately, because uh, then I think we can do some good work together. Um, but they, they, they're quite horrible. Um, so, in order to solve the scattering solutions, we're going to employ a trick. I'm going to spend a lot of the lecture exactly going through exactly what this trick is. Um, it's called the pull mile reduction. And in the case of strings on R cos S2, study, the pull mile reduced uh, theory is exactly the sign order model that of course was mentioned yesterday. And the sign order model is an integral model. Which Q has been uh, discussing with you guys. And in integrability, I've got very powerful tools in order to come up with more general solutions. And this is what we're going to use in order to write down the scattering solution. All right, so, if I don't have time to finish it now, I'll, uh, most of the tutorial is exactly on this uh, streak, this method. And um, we can just do the first bit of that just to give it some more details. Right. So we can work with the number go to action uh, thus far. Uh, it's been convenient for us. We've done the solutions quite easily. Uh, for the purpose of the power reduction, we're going to have to use uh, all work of action. But as I've argued a number of times, these two are classically equivalent. So it's, uh, we really have to figure out both. But I'm again just going to drop the functionality constants and introduce them later. But the all work of action for uh, um, it's given by the follows square root minus h h a e b a x u d b q right. where just to refresh your memories what this h corresponds to is a dynamical wall sheet metric for which I also get equations of motion and if I um, satisfy these equations of motion I really get the wall sheet metric, the uh, reduced wall sheet metric that we had from the number of action. Right. So, and specifically, we want to study this on this R cross S2. However, to, we can also approach this slightly differently and say that, well, I can also think of R cross S2 in terms of so called embedding coordinates. Some of you may have encountered this before. For the sake of those that can't remember or haven't seen this before, I'll just go through this quite quickly. What we're going to do is the following. So let's focus just on the S2 part of this. R cross S2. And um, let's just say, okay, well, let's work in one dimensional higher, but let's work with uh, flat to dx1 r squared plus dx2 bar squared plus dx3 bar squared. Alright? With a constraint. We're going to say that we're going to constrain these coordinates to live on a unit circle. Uh, plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x1. Now, what does this mean for the metric if I now, respect to this surface where this constraint is satisfied, 
Well, I can compute. Uh, let's compute the x1. Um, oh, before I compute that, let's just pick a set of coordinates in which this is naturally satisfied, so I don't need to do any addition. What? The choice when this is naturally satisfied is x1 bar is equal to cosine theta cos phi. x2 bar is equal to cos theta sine phi. And x3 bar is equal to sine. Right. You can check that with this choice. If I take x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, that condition is automatically satisfied for each choice of theta. Now, what happens to the metric if I um, study it at this, on the surface with this constraint? Well, let's compute uh, what's dx1 bar. I get sine theta cosine phi theta plus cosine theta sine phi phi. And for the x2 bar, I get sine theta sine phi theta minus cosine theta cosine phi phi. Dx3 bar. Uh, start having up. Right. Which should be minus? Uh, oh, uh, which should be minus? Dx1 bar. Yeah, two times. Ah, should be minus. Okay. Excellent. Right. All right. Dx3 bar is Just a polyakov on uh, r cross on r three, along with this conditional constraint that's going to put me down on the base two. I'm going to force it, and um, you can study the equations of motion on this. Um, I think I'm just going to sit up for this afternoon, and we can discuss the details of this method. 
But roughly to get the Versorgung constraints, what I need to do is take the following functional prohibitor, delta over delta of H, let's say CD of S. And uh, what I get is the following. I get minus DCT DDT plus DCX bar. Uh, or DDX bar. Uh, let me just again emphasize here. In this case, if I mean the dot, I mean the dot with respect to this metric here. We will come to some linear coordinates, and this is the metric I'm going to get. So no longer the curve is too far. Minus a half HCD plus HAB minus the AT DT plus AX dot DX. Right. And um, there's a specific choice for the wall sheet metric that's very convenient here. And that is the following one. HCD is equal to 0, 2, 2, 0. I believe this is uh, life cone gauge being given, right? I'm not 100% on that, but uh, this is a different choice of gauge. This is related to our old perform gauge of the following. Um, so I uh, had tau and sigma before, and now define the combination tau plus sigma to be some x plus, and minus to be an x minus. And then I've got you know, an x plus x plus component, x plus x minus component, x minus x plus, x minus x minus. And um, in the reason this choice is so convenient is because these Virasova constraints become really simple, or for one. <coughs> Alright. Um, the Virasova constraints simply become the following B plus X bar dot d plus x bar was equal to d plus t squared similar for minus and minus x bar dot d minus x bar was equal to d minus t squared and uh, the rest of the equations of motion you could just do by taking derivatives with respect to x and t and what I get then is the following plus d minus x mu minus this lambda x mu is equal to zero and d plus d minus t is equal to zero and of course from the functional derivative with respect to the Lagrange multiplier I just get the cross term that x dot x must be equal to one okay now if I don't have any time I have to All right, so the rest of the reduction is going to be to study these equations of motion and come up with, uh, you know, uh, rewrite them in a way that a different equation of motion becomes apparent after I enforced some of these constraints. Specifically, I'm going to enforce these very simple constraints and we'll be left with some freedom in the system and this is going to give me a new equation of motion. To find these, it's essentially an exercise in the following kind of manipulations. So, let's take this expression over here. All right. All I can do with that is take the dot product with respect to x. So I'm going to multiply this with uh, x mu and uh, contract. So I'm just yeah. Um, so what I get is x dot. Uh, this combination d plus d minus x must give me lambda times x dot x. From this constraint, I know this is 1. So this is what lambda is. However, this is not going to be a very convenient form for lambda for me. So I'm just going to take a look at one of these other expressions that I could use. Um, oh, I'm just going to use this one again. I'm just going to say, so this tells me that this combination is equal to 1. So if I take d plus on this, x dot x dot then of course I'm going to get zero and if I take d minus of that again then I'm again going to get zero if I multiply this out what I actually get is that d plus d 
b minus x dot x plus b plus x dot b minus x must be equal to 0. If you want to prove it, so uh, uh, there's a term where b stick onto one of the derivatives, and uh, one where it sticks onto uh, you know, two, two of them separately, which is what I get. And this then tells me that I can find lambda as minus d minus x dot d plus x. All right. Now, it might not be 100% correct, but this is more convenient for us um, going forward. Um, so this is the one simplification that I get. The other simplification, now I'm going to focus on the solver constraints, try to solve them. From these two constraints, it's clear that what t must be is it must be some function of x plus plus another function of x minus. Right? Because if it's in this form, then the two um, oh wait, I think I made a mistake in writing these numbers, sorry about that. It should be d plus d minus. tells me that t must be some function of x plus plus another function of x minus. Right. Now, I'm not going to go through the rest of the manipulations. I'm afraid I don't have that much time left. But what you essentially do is, and I'll go through this in the tutorial session, I just want to summarize for those that uh, won't be able to make it. Um, after a bit of manipulation, I get the following set of equations. So, firstly, I satisfy some of those constraints. I use conformal symmetry and characterization of the variance problem um, to eventually come up with the following x of x is equal to 1, d plus x dot d plus x is equal to some constant, all this being squared, positive constant. Same with minus, must be equal to the same constant. Uh, x is orthogonal to d plus and minus. And the unknown in my problem is what's the angle between d plus x and d minus x? Cosine of 2 5. And now using very similar manipulations, so taking derivatives of the dark products of these things, you can eventually show the following, and this is all of what we're going to do in the tutorial, d plus d minus of phi plus mu squared over 2 sine of 2 phi plus d minus of That's the equation of motion that this unknown angle between these two things must satisfy. And uh, if you um, look at this long enough, you will recognize this to be exactly the equations of motion of the sine of the So this is exactly the equation of motion of the following function uh, plus sine d minus sine plus u squared of 2 cosine 2 phi minus 1. This is the equation of motion of this function. This is exactly the sine order model. It's an integral model that can use tools of equality to find more solutions of uh, the, one, the ones I'm interested in. All I need to do is take a solution of the sine order model, and then I need to find the inverse mapping of this transformation in order to write out the solutions for strings on R plus S2. All right. Um, I'll show you the inverse mapping and the manipulations that get you to this point this afternoon, and then there's going to be a few top problems and examples.